time. Um, welcome. It's it's different. I haven't. I don't think I've seen everybody from this view before. But um, for those of you who maybe don't know, my name's Jay. Um, I was teasing um, Sister Melissa earlier today. It's been 20 years since I've known Pastor Tom and Stella in my life. Wow, that's awesome. That's both good and sad at times. <laughs> Um, I always tried to give Pastor Tom a lot of credit because I know what I was like when I met him. And I wouldn't... Everybody likes to give credit to the Lord. And please don't misunderstand me. Yes, the Lord's important in my life. But I needed an example to follow. And while I sometimes regret what Pastor Tom and Stella went through in the blue building, me watching him go through that Staying in faith, staying in love, anchored something in me. It's like, it can be done. I can live the word. Amen. We had just come back from our first Africa trip when we first met Pastor Tom and Stella. And I had told people in Africa that that first trip really was more for me than it was serving the Lord. I needed to prove that I could set my life aside and dedicate myself to the Lord. We were in Zimbabwe for 30 days. And I needed to prove to myself that I could do that. Not think about, oh, did, what about, you know, did I leave the iron plugged in? You know, something to really say. I needed to be able to just cast my life aside and trust him for 30 days. So it was very effective for me. And then it was maybe, gosh, I, I'd like to say it was less than a month later that... Um, Sister Dawn had asked Pastor Tom to help take over, so Pastor Tom took my wife and I out to dinner, and we had a chance to meet them. We were serving as a treasurer on the board of that church at the time, and he took us out. And from that dinner and little things, it's never, that's the beauty of, I think, of what Pastor Tom lives his life, and even when he teaches from the pulpit, it's the little things that completely fills out the scripture or the or the story yeah. or the teaching or the anointing. And yeah. I think about that because that's part of what part of the reason we're here today. I'm actually going to spend I know he's talked about at least two Saturdays, it might be more, it might be less. I'll I'll trust Pastor on that. To talk a little bit about prosperity and finances. If you haven't been paying attention to his series on leadership, and he's focused a little bit of that into the marriage and, and the roles. He said something, and it's so true. He's mentioned more than once, you do what's important to you. Yes. And sometimes that smacks in your head, and you're like, well, duh, why didn't I think of that before? Right. And the first time he said that, when he started to teach, it rose up in me, you spend money on what's important to you. Yeah, so, yeah. And I go, oh, I better... It's not that I haven't heard him teach on leadership before. Like I said, he's been my pastor now for 20 years. But every time he comes back to a subject and he teaches on it again, even if I've heard the stories before, even if I've read the scripture before, I've grown in other areas of my life. And that teaching finds a way to kind of slot into the rest of the teaching better. And I have a better overall view of how the word works and how God works in our lives and how I can apply that teaching to more than just leadership. And I thought about that because when you think about prosperity and finances, we're all raised in the world. And, in, and when you come into the body of Christ, yeah. you need somebody who can shake the world's thinking of money out of you yes. and get the proper perspective yeah. of God's prosperity and God's yeah. wealth in your spirit so you can yeah. live it. So... That's kind of where I started. I mean, you can open your Bibles to 3 John. This is going to kind of be the, the scripture I'm going to base a lot of what I'm talking about on. But if you were going to think about divine health or divine healing or living in divine health, to me, the scripture you kind of base that on is, you know, by his stripes, you were healed. Once you know that that's God's will for your life, done. Now, how do I get there? What do I need to change? Yeah. What do I need to do? How do I stay there? Yeah. You know? 
And that's where I think, okay, where's a good starting point? Where do we, if we're going to talk about prosperity and wealth, let's get that, okay, this is where we start, okay, this is his will for us, this is what he wants, so now how do we go get it? So, and I always start, and I should probably get there myself, Third John. I like the letters of John, I know Pastor John likes to tease and call it Little John, because John was the only one of the 12 apostles they didn't martyr. I sometimes had to think about that. How, why? What was so special about John? And if you study it and you go else, John was one of the brothers, that, the sons of thunder, ready to call. He was ready to bring the wrath of God down on that city. And at times I kind of relate to that. Um, in the middle of that, the, the situation with the blue building, um, I had to communicate to the congregation what had happened. And... I, I admit I was young in the Lord, but I was kind of proud of myself. I had taken some time. I hadn't just blurted something out. I prayed a little bit, and I kind of I had come up with a, a letter that we were going to have to send. Um, we were going to have to call everybody to let them know. And I called them, and I was kind of proud of myself. You know, kind of wanting Pastor Tom to give me the old pat on the back kind of thing. You know, he'll, he'll like that I really got going on it. And I can laugh now, but at the time, that letter that I wrote, it was true. It had scripture in it, but it was written from hurt. It was written from hurt and anger. So even though it said the right things and it said the truth, it didn't carry the right message. Sure. So I read that to him. I'm like, yeah, you know, I kind of. Yeah. He goes, and, and I'll never forget because he didn't have to. He didn't have to beat me up. He didn't have to, you know. It's like, well, Jay, why don't you pray about that a little bit? And then send that if you feel like you should. Hey, talk about like pop on a balloon. <laughs> but again, it, it, it's pa Pastor Tom deals with each of us in our own way. He's, one of his best skills as a pastor is that he's able to know what you need. Yeah. And the way he deals with Melissa yeah. isn't the way he deals with me, or he deals with Dee in a different way. You know? and, he, he, and that's a skill that I, I always admire. So... So yeah, I had wanted to lash out sure. at the people who did what they did, and, I, and it, it reflected in that letter. So I kind of kind of want to come back to Third John, but that was John. But then now, later on, he become, they call him the Apostle of Love. And I think something happened to him at the Mount of Transfiguration that all, I mean, literally changed his entire perspective. Not on, only on God, but on himself, on love. I mean, it, it and that, that's where I think when we maybe hear, the first time we hear about faith or the first time we hear about prosperity or anything, we come at it with where we are in the world. And we don't always know how it fits into the rest of it. So if you think about this, and, and uh, I'll actually read it, this is kind of the... the foundation scripture when it comes to prosperity and finances. And uh, 3 John chapter 2 says, Beloved, I pray that you may prosper in all things and be in health just as your soul prospers. And I'm reading, I want to make sure, yep, it was New King James. The King James doesn't have an all things. But it's actually a pretty good translation because um, the word prosper in the Greek, excuse me, the word prosper in the Greek actually does mean successful in all things, success, successful in all business things. So that's John's, I mean, if, if the apostle of love is saying, hey, and we know that the, the word is, you know, the Holy Spirit speaking through him. He wants us to prosper. He wants us to be successful in all things. Even as he, even as, okay, our soul how do we make our soul prosper? Washing by the water of the word, renewing your mind. So as we renew our mind, as we learn more, as we grow in the word, yeah. he wants us to then prosper in all other things. Yeah. And I think I'm starting to get to a point in, in my walk with the Lord where it's easier for me to take that step back and go, oh, I kind of see how that fits together now. 
I used to kind of be in, oh, I'm in faith mode. Oh, I'm in prayer mode. Oh, I'm in, you know. And you take the teaching that Pastor Tom focuses on and you, you forget, I don't, forget's not the right term. You don't apply all the other stuff you've already learned into yeah, what yeah, he's yeah. teaching you. Yeah. But in a, in a way, this, this scripture is a progressive yes, it is. That's right. blessing. That's right. As your soul prospers, as you renew your mind in the yeah, word, as you right grow on. in the Lord, yes. he wants you to prosper in all things. Yeah. He wants you to have what you need to be successful. And if you... If you don't have the right balance, yes. how many people have you seen who prosper in the world and have an abundance of wealth without the yes. prosperity of the soul yes. and their life is a wreck? Yes. And I'm not just talking secular people or people that you see in the world. No. Um, one, of my, uh, one of the stories that I remember from Ambassador Huggins is that church that he did that service and he spoke to them power of God came upon that entire service and that of that small little congregation, like 34 of them became millionaires in a year. And everybody's like, yeah, wow. Listen to the rest of his story when he talks about that. Because the next time he came to that church and a couple years later, one, not a single one of them had become a partner with him. 30 of the 34 were like not even coming to church anymore. They were playing with their boats and yeah, yeah. doing all their cars. and yeah, yeah. Wow. Did, Were they really prospering in all things? No, I, no not at all. Um, and it's easy, okay, now before you, before you start judging them, <laughs> okay, look inside and say, okay, oh, have I ever done that? One of the reasons it's so hard to talk about money and finances is because it's the one area where you feel like they're yours. I worked for that money. Did you really? I'm, I, okay, I mean, where does the rubber meet the road here? Did you really work for that? I'm not saying you sat at home on your couch potato and it fell, out, fell through the roof, but did you really work for that or has God placed you in a position to receive that blessing? Okay, I'm, <laughs> I, I don't want to be too harsh, but I, I really did. I kind of... <laughs> I, uh, there were a few, few, as I was writing all my notes and then kind of getting the scriptures together, I kind of, I asked D, and D, even D kind of looked at me, I don't know. But I, the first question that kind of, what's the purpose of money? Okay. Did Jesus need money to feed the 5,000? No. Nope. Did he need money to change the water to wine, his first miracle? No. 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 Now, could he have done it with money? Oh, sure, he could have sent the servants out to buy the best, you know, but he didn't need it. But I think one of the reasons money is so important and one of the reasons why money creates a lot of problems in marriages in the world, even in the church, one of the reasons why it causes a lot of church splits. And I know... I know family members, not only mine, but family members of other people in the church that have real problems when you start talking about God wanting to prosper you. Talk about God healing them? Absolutely. Not a problem. If, yeah, gung-ho. But he wants me to be what? No, that can't. No. I got to be humble. I got to be poor. One of my favorite songs is A Little Drummer Boy. But I hate that word. I'm a poor boy, too. Well. Okay. One, if you actually study what the wise, what the wise man gave to Mary and Joseph, not in a manger, not, okay, right around the time he was two, okay, study a little bit. But they gave him gold, frankincense, and myrrh, three of the most valuable, expensive. Why? Because the Lord knew he was going to have to ship them away for a few years because... Herod was going to come kill him, so they were going to need something to support themselves when they were on the run. God, it worked. If you just study it, it works. It's so cool. But we want to get trapped in our cute little stereotypes, and it maybe makes me feel better if I can say I'm humble and poor, just like Jesus. No. 
Jesus was never poor. And that's where it comes down to poverty, prosperity, our mindsets. Yes, totally. It has nothing to do with how much money is in your bank account at any given time. Prosperity is how you view your life and God's calling on your life. Yes. Yes. I'm getting ahead of myself. Sorry. Um, But I think if we would take a step of faith and realize, I don't know how I'm going to do that, but the Lord told me to do that, so I'm going to start doing that. Maybe he'll provide you with a gift. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over. Or maybe you're just going to have a miracle like Jesus with the loaves and the fishes. That's right. That's right. Just on a little side note, little rabbit trail on that. Notice how there were so many scraps left over that they had 12 baskets full. How many disciples are there? So every, every disciple had to carry a basket of leftovers, and I think that was purposeful. Yeah, yeah. So look at that. Because <laughs> they were like, well, how are we going to feed these people? We don't even have enough more money. Just, you know, took what he had, blessed it, and it worked. So why don't we go ahead and uh, I'm going to jump a little bit, but let's go ahead and go to Haggai, chapter 2. And I'm sure that you're there all the time. It's in your morning devotionals as you do Haggai. <laughs> My Bible but no, I wanted to talk. I have helped different individuals, different couples. Um, Pastor Thomas sent people to DNI when they need help with their finances and with their budget. And, the, and in the 20 years that we've been doing this and the dozens of people that we've helped, I can honestly say that I have yet to come across a person who has not had enough income to support themselves. Maybe not in the way they wanted, maybe not in as much comfort as they wanted, but when God says he will not leave us nor forsake us, okay, I think it's in Matthew, I have, I know I have it written down in my notes. If he's, you know, if he's going to make the lilies in the field, he's certainly not going to leave you. Amen. But I think what happened, a couple of things, and, and as I was praying and I'm looking at this, I started to take some of the other teachings that Pastor Tom has given me that I've w- walked through the years and say, well, how does that affect finances? How does that affect wealth? And I come back to the parable of the sower. To me, the strongest point for, like on a Saturday, when we're here at a training institute, we're so already supposed to be telling ourselves, we're, we want to be trained. We want to be that next step up. We don't have to worry about the seed thrown on the wayside. Or in stony ground. Okay, do you understand? We, if you are, you're not here today if you're in those two areas. So, let's look at the other two. And everybody likes to go to the final part. 100, 160, 30, 40. I'm rocking it, baby. And I can probably venture to guess that most of us, at least at one point in our lives, have been in that area where everything, it was cooking on all cylinders. We were bringing people to the Lord. Nothing seemed to be going wrong. Anything the devil threw at us, it was like rolling off our backs. But if you actually study the third set, it mentions the cares of this world caused them to become unfruitful. So they were fruitful at one time, and now they've become unfruitful. I would argue with you with that church of 34 millionaires that the wealth and the instant freedom they had caused them to become unfruitful. Did they still have their wealth? In the world, yeah. But you don't get to take any of that with you. You know, streets are paved with gold, so it it has no function up there, okay? But if you look at the world, Money really is the highest form of power in the world, in the secular world. Now, we're not of this world. 
But it really is the highest form of power in the world. You can accomplish just about anything in the world if you have enough money. Yeah. It barely scratches the scratch of God's anointing and God's power yeah. in our life. Hallelujah. I'm not saying it's not important. I'm not saying you shouldn't be good stewards of it. I'm not, we're going to talk about yeah. ways to change your thinking. But it, we put way too much of an emphasis on it yeah. and forget what it is God's called us to do. So when I said, what is the purpose of money? Really, in the world, money is nothing more than an exchange of goods and services. We've determined that it cost a good exchange for a gallon of gas is $2.09. So that's an exchange. That's all it is. It just, re it just reflects a change for goods and services. That's all money is. There's, there's, there's nothing more diabolical than that. There's nothing more heavenly than that. It's just simply an exchange. That brought me to my second question. What do you need money for? And I wish Steve was in here at the time she's serving the way she's supposed to, but she instantly answered the way I think most of us jump to the same conclusion. I'm not trying to um, signal my, single my wife out. It is her birthday, by the way, so yeah, I have a chance to say. So, Thank you for telling me. Yeah, yeah, I'm sure she's real happy about that. <laughs> But, what do you need money for? And he's like, well, to pay our bills. Really? It's, I'm just, do you use money to pay your bills? Yes. Is that what you need money for? This is where I think the maturity starts to show. What do you need money for? And I think if you can get to the point in your life where you realize, I don't need money. I need God's anointing. I need God's wisdom. Okay? Arguably the wealthiest person in history is Solomon. But did Solomon pursue wealth? No. Did he ask for wealth? No. He asked for wisdom so he could serve God's people. And what happened? Wealth came. And I promise you that if you will spend the time and you will focus on what God called you to do. He's, okay? In Ephesians, it already says he's already given us every spiritual blessing. So you've got everything you need. Now you just need the Lord's guidance to focus it. Focus it where you need it. Focus how you need to use it. I'm telling you that if you do that properly, money will not be an issue. Being a good steward of it might be. Okay. But the money itself coming to you will not be an issue. I'm just as sure, because yeah, if I come back to Jesus feeding the 5,000, one of the questions he asked beforehand, and I'm kind of paraphrasing it, so I'm not sure I'm saying it exactly right. He's like, well, bring what you got. What do you got? Bring me what you have. And I am sure that if they would have come up with, well, all we got is three gold, he would have multiplied the three gold until they had enough to buy the food they needed. Do you understand what I'm saying? He took what was given to him, blessed it, and it multiplied. I don't think he says, bring me what food you got. I think he says, bring... Bring forward what you have. Bring what you have. Now they might have, I think the disciples said, well, all we've got is, you know, a fish and a couple loaves. He, when, when his mom pesters him to perform his first miracle, he does, you know, he just takes what's there. It's so, okay, fine. I, I need to honor my mother, father and mother. I'll do this for you. I think that is a lot of the reason why he does it, because he's supposed to honor his mother and father. I don't know that the Lord necessarily told him directly, Jesus, change out the wine. But the word does say, to obey thy parents, to honor them. So I think there's a scriptural need for him to be able to do that. Even though at times in my life I like to think, yeah, oh yeah, I've been pestered like that some too. <laughs> but that's just me getting into my flesh. But uh, if we would spend more time focusing on his anointing, 
his calling in our life, the influence he's given us. You have more influence than you realize. I have non-Christian friends that are stunned at how non-judgmental and how kind and generous we are because they've never seen an example of a Christian in their life that way. Every Christian that's ever come across, they've ever come across before us, was judgmental, critical, thinking they were better than them. I've been there. I've done the same thing, okay? I mean, it's easy to look back and kind of cringe almost. Oh, I used to be that way. I see some of the stuff that's gone on, some of the rioting, some of the protests and different things. And I'm not talking about the end result, but that method never works. Do you understand that even the Boston Tea Party, we like to rah-rah that up? That didn't solve anything. It escalated things. It escalated things. Yeah. Now, I have a feeling that we were at a place where the war was inevitable with, with Britain, but that Boston Tea Party didn't solve, it didn't make the tax go away. It didn't solve the problem. It escalated the problem. I don't think we're meant to escalate. I think we're meant to solve. That's just my humble opinion. That was free, not part of the script, not part of today's sermon, so you take it or leave it as you wish. But I think we're meant to solve problems. If you solve problems, whether they be in the business world, in personal lives, families, schools, even your church, you will be blessed and I believe abundantly provided for. Because I have so many examples of, of, in Scripture. And, and, and we'll come back to Haggai because I think it, it does such a good job of of explaining this. But in chapter 2 of Haggai, I'm going to start in verse 6. For thus says the Lord of hosts, once more, it is a little while, I will shake heaven and earth, the sea and dry land. And I will shake all nations, and they shall come to desire of all nations. And I will fill this temple with glory, says the Lord of hosts. Okay? If you tie that into what Pastor Tom's been talking about, what's on the horizon, what's coming, doesn't that sound like, okay, we're getting ready to, he's going to shake it all up, baby. Okay? So, he's just talked about shaking everything, bringing his glory. Woohoo! What's the very next thing he says? The silver is mine, and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. What? Where, why? What? This scripture throws those people who don't like to talk about money and don't like to talk about prosperity right out the window. Because next, the glory of the latter temple shall be greater than the former, yeah. says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, says the Lord of hosts. Former glory, latter glory, money right in the middle of it. Yeah. 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 I, <laughs> It doesn't get any plainer to me. I didn't make that up. <laughs> I, I, I didn't try to, I don't, I don't even think, that, it's twisted. I simply read it to you. I don't know how much clearer you can get. You, I believe if you're going to function in his glory, if you're going to fulfill his calling in your life, you will have the most impact when you are able to do it with wealth. Okay, I have friends that still aren't sure that the Lord used me to heal people in Africa. Why? Because they didn't see it. They didn't see me lay my hands on those deaf people and have their ears open up. Now, on the one hand, I experienced that. So there, there is nothing you can say or do that's going to shake my faith in that. Okay, But on the other hand, if you weren't with me, I could be blown smoke, right? I mean, I could just be trying to puff myself up. You don't know. But those same people who aren't sure, when they see D and I give, when they see D and I go out of our way to help people, just because the Lord leads us to, I'm not trying to make us special in any sort of way. 
But we have gotten better at hearing from him Amen. and knowing how far to take it without it becoming too much. Yes. You don't want to do, give so much or do so much that that person all of a sudden feels diminished yes. that they aren't good enough. Yes. Right. You know, it's one thing to give help and to be a blessing. It's another thing to say, well, you aren't good enough to take care of yourself. Here, let me do it. Okay, so there's... There, but that comes with experience. I would rather err on the side of giving too much than giving too little. But, but you understand, yeah. the same people who say, well, I'm not sure that, I don't, I don't know if you, he can really use you that way. I don't know if he really heals people. Can't argue with the other examples in our life that they can see. Yeah. So you need to be able to say, okay, Lord, I just got a raise. Why? What? What? First of all, you don't have to get, I mean, you don't, you're not entitled to a raise. Don't, don't ever think you're entitled to anything. All we're entitled to is bad, okay? <laughs> okay? We've all sinned and fall short of the glory of God. The only thing we're entitled to is hell, okay? So let's, let's just get rid of what we're entitled to and talk about how he wants to bless us and use us. And money is a, a valuable way because the world responds to money. The body of Christ will respond to the anointing, but even if you read a little bit when you start talking about being decent and in order with the gifts of the Spirit, there are certain things that happen spiritually that scare the fire out of the world. So, I believe that one of the reasons he's placed us here, asked us to be successful, is so we can take his love and his word and his glory and let it let our money work through that. Yes, amen. And that only works if we get the proper perspective yes, amen. on what place money has in your life, yes. in your heart. You can't serve God and money. But you certainly, I mean, you know, if all I have is a hammer, I'm going to have a tough time building a house. But if I've got the money to buy the hammer, the nails, the saw, the wood, if, you understand? I mean, Money can be applied in so many different ways yes. that it truly can open doors. It truly can influence yes. things. It can change things. Yes. Yes. Okay? But without the Lord, you have no guarantee of that. Look at the woman with the issue of blood. Yes. She had spent all she had. Yes. And it didn't sound, it, they don't make that sound like it was an insignificant amount. Okay? Right. So you can't, you can't, you don't want to separate the money from the glory. You don't want to pull the money out and use it differently. And I think that's where, when I was younger and I first started to kind of glean some of this, that's what I was trying to do. I was trying to take what I was learning about finances and just apply it to the world. Excuse me, instead of asking for, how am I supposed to use this, Lord? Yeah, yeah, right, amen. Right. Okay. Hallelujah. You, the anointing in your life creates influence. The friendships you develop creates influence. That's why I think he wants us to have friends that don't go to church. They need to see an example of a good Christian. And if all we do is come here on Saturday and we don't let it go anywhere else, we do the world a disservice. We'll have a great time, but we'll do the world a disservice. We have something to give. We have something to share. And you can't sit here for a year with Pastor Tom and not have more to share than you did a year ago. I'm, I'm sorry. I, one of the most effective teachers I've ever met, and we partner with, with quite a few. But the other, one of the things I love about Faith Life Fellowship is they don't just tell you. Right. Pastor Tom never gives you a sermon and says, go. Yeah. His sermons always talk about how are you going to do that? How are you going to apply it? Here's some testimony of how I used it and how I used it the right way and the wrong way to help you put it all in perspective so you can actually make this alive. Hallelujah. <laughs> it's only alive if you live it, people. <laughs> It's only alive if you actually are using it every day. Yeah. It's not alive just because you read it. No. Okay, that was free too, but... Um, one of the... As I was praying about the, the these... And like I said, it'll probably be a few different messages because I want to talk... I want to talk about strongholds and how strongholds affect how you spend money, but I'm not going to get to that today. But... One of the things the Lord told me is how people perceive money 
is one of the biggest reasons or one of the larger reasons why they are in his permissive will instead of his perfect will. And I had to kind of go, ouch, that's probably me. <laughs> am I in his permissive will or am I in his perfect will? And that brought me to the parable of the talents. And I won't spend all the time to read that. But even I've taught about the parable of the talents, talking about what you have inside of you. Because the master gave the money according to their ability. That word ability is actually dunamis. Yeah. Which if you'll study elsewhere is, is power associated with the Holy Spirit. So I've used that parable to talk about how if you take that anointing he plants inside of you and apply it and use it, he'll give you more. And if you keep applying it and using it, he'll give you more. And, I, and that's truly a, a true teaching. But take the parable literally, what did the master do? He gave them money. Yeah. And then when it was all said and done, he came back and asked for an account of his money. If heaven is like that, that means part of what you're going to face on the judgment scene isn't just, oh, did you witness to that person like I told you to? Did you pray for that person like I told you to? Did you spend money for that like I told you to? Right. Amen. <laughs> I mean, I've got a parable here now that says heaven is like this. And I look at that, the one servant who doesn't get well done, thou good and faithful servant, is the one who didn't use it for anything. Mm -hmm. yeah. So if all you ever do is take the blessing of the, the finances and the wealth that God gives you and uses it for you, if, you, if that's all you ever do, I think that's where you're at. Now, I, I, I don't have a, it's not a direct teaching, it is a parable, so I mean, you can give me a little bit of grace, but I think you can see the value in the fact that you're in safer ground if you use that yep. and spend it to help right. create more influence. I wanted to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. But I was a horrible money manager when I got saved. Horrible. Yeah. It's because I didn't, have a, I didn't have an example. I didn't have anybody in my life. My mom and dad were horrible money managers. Their mom and dad were horrible money managers. Because what does the world tell you to do? Hoard, save, scrimp. What does God say? Give. Give, give, and it shall be given unto you. I Even in Deuteronomy, it talks about he's going to give us the power to get wealth. So obviously, one, he wants us to, he, he doesn't want slothful. Children, okay? He wants children who are willing to work. But then he's going to give us wealth. And again, he doesn't need wealth to give you the clothes on your back, to put food on your table, to put a roof over your head. Now, he'll bless you usually in ways that you can take part of your income and use it for that. I'm not trying to say stop paying your house bill, okay? <laughs> All right. Don't come back, well, Jay said I don't have to, so it's his fault that my power's off. No, you didn't pay the bill, okay? But understand that he doesn't need money to take care of the lilies in the field. And he tells you, quit worrying about it. I got you. But we, if we spend so much time worrying about, well, am I going to have enough to pay rent next month? We forget to ask God, okay, God, what am I supposed to be doing today? It might not have anything to do with money, but we've, got, we've become so focused on, uh oh, am I going to have rent next month? Yeah, that's good. That we missed that opportunity. We missed that person that we were supposed to pay their gas. Oh, I missed that person I was supposed to heal because they have a bad back. Oh, I missed that person I was supposed to witness to them. Because we let our focus become, uh oh, I, I, my phone bill's due next week. Okay? Yeah. Now, there's balance in all things. Part of what we're going to talk about is if you aren't willing to come up here with your credit card statement and your bank statement and read every line off and have everybody, everybody here <laughs> know what you're spending your money on, oh. okay? The only, the only person I've never been able to help who Pastor Thomas sent us or some other people 
I tell people, and I, I know it might sound vulgar from the pulpit, I say, you need to get fiscally naked with me. I need to know everything. You can't hide anything. And the only person, the only person I wasn't able, okay, first of all, I've had people who were alcoholics that I was able to help. I've had people who were addicted to tobacco that I was able to help. Okay, I've been able to help people change their perspectives a little bit. The only person I was never able to help, and I couldn't figure out why, until later, he was spending money on adult websites. And he wasn't telling me. So I'm like, you're showing me your income. I'm looking at your expenses. There's a big gap here. What's going on? I need he wouldn't tell me. He quit coming to get help. And then it's kind of funny because we found out we let him use our computer to um, get his bank statement. And the next time, I don't know if you went on it next or if I went on it next, we were like, you know how sometimes you go to one of those websites and the next thing you know, your whole like, computer's infected with stuff. I'm like, what? I think Dee thought I did it. I'm like, I don't know what's going on here, you know? <laughs> but, but, but that's how we found out, you know? Um, and again, I don't, I'm not, okay? It's real easy for us to go, oh, that guy is horrible. Well, you know what? Lying's just as bad. Yeah. Worrying is just as bad. Yeah. Stop categorizing, yeah. cap, stop categorizing yeah. sin yes. and think that my sin's not as bad no. as yours. No, all sin is bad. Okay? And first of all, there's nothing in here that tells you to look at other people's sins. No. <laughs> okay, you can judge the fruit of it. You shouldn't necessarily associate somebody that's flaunting their sin. Okay? I mean, but... Examine yourselves. Take care of yourself. Clean your own house. <laughs> okay? And then maybe the Lord will bless you and put you in a leadership position where you can influence others. But you, even if Pastor Tom's job is not to judge you as a pastor. That's not his job. He'll tell you that. His job is to prepare you for your calling. And sometimes that means, okay, quit being an idiot, Jay. <laughs> Okay, pull your head out of the sand, shake it out, and let's go here. Sometimes, sometimes he has to do that, but that's not his job. It's not his job is up here with, the, with the, you know, lightning bolt of Zeus and zapping people who aren't doing it the right way. That's not, that's not how it works. Okay. So, but of all, it's it's amazing to me that I have I've had people who were on government assistance, all the way through people who have been married and and both had close to six-figure jobs that I was able to help because they got so wrapped up in where they were financially that they lost sight of what was important. Money is not important. Necessary to be in the world. Again, we live in the world. We're not of the world. So it's, it's, I'm not saying that you don't need it. It's okay. Things are better with money than without. I've had both. Okay, they are better with money. But the the example I kept coming back to was Solomon. Solomon operated under a worse covenant than we have. We have a better covenant built upon better promises, and he still became wealthier. Why haven't why hasn't someone in the body of Christ surpassed Solomon in wealth? Why? They have a better covenant. They have better promises. Why? Because I, the, to me, the answer to that question is, is because Solomon, Solomon never asked for it. He never pursued it. Amen. Amen. And yeah. if I could, without naming names or without trying to sound judgmental, most of the teachings, even when I was younger, that talk about prosperity, almost, it's real easy to see how the world applies like a name it and claim it type of thing. Yeah. You can have cars, you can have homes, you can yeah, have... Yeah, yeah. Can, can I give you what I think is a great, yeah. one of the best scriptural definitions of prosperity? I'm going to use my phone because I want to read it from the Amplified, but go to 2 Corinthians chapter 9. Wow. I still got time left. Okay, good. I hope you're getting something out of this. I hope I'm... The, one of the trickiest things is when you start talking, like I said, money is personal for everybody. Mm -hmm. yeah. And 
the hardest thing to do is to try to talk about it and talk about some of the real truths without hurting anybody's feelings. I don't want to do that. I'm not here to, to, I'm not here to offend anybody. I don't want to hurt anybody's feelings. I do hope some conviction comes. Comes to me. Okay, I need it too. I do hope that Holy Spirit is able to kind of, wherever you need it. And that might have, you might have already had your one little jab today and the rest is good. Yay! You might be like me and actually had a few jabs. <laughs> okay. But I don't want, I don't want people going out here going, oh, he just thinks I'm a low down, da 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 da. It has nothing to do with where I think you are. I don't care where anybody is. I only care about, am I doing what the Lord's telling me to do? Not only teaching here, but when I go home and I actually take a look, I, I've mentioned from the pulpit before that about two years ago we were kind of, okay, nothing on the outside changed. We were still prosperous in our jobs. We were still well like, but now all of a sudden we didn't have enough money. We were, things started to break down. We started to have extra bills that weren't there before. And I'm like, that, that's not right. That can't, I mean, and I went to the Lord and said, Lord, you know, Malachi says, you know, he goes, really? What does Malachi say? <laughs> and I had failed to increase our tithe. He had blessed us, but I was no longer tithing. I thought I was. The intent was to tithe, but I lost focus. Didn't take, oh my gosh, it was less than six weeks. We corrected that. Because we've always, I mean, yeah. um, I know tithing works because I know what my life was like before I started oh, the tithe. Yes. And there's nothing I can, I can't explain it to you better than give a little bit of testimony. The year before we tithed, both Dan and I had to stay in the hospital. We actually had to buy a car for $500 and a comic book to Joel, from Joel's father. And we were in the whole Desperately, I mean, we were just behind everything. And it was the way it was said. It's like, you might be saying, I can't afford to tithe. And the answer was, you can't afford not to. I'm like, it was one of those instances where Dee and I made a quality decision together. And we've never had to go back. Did we make the right decision? You know, we just did it. it. You know, okay. So, and the funny part is, is for the first six weeks or a couple of months, it, our bills didn't go away, they changed colors. <laughs> okay, some of you have had that happen to you before, maybe some of you haven't, yay. You know, final notice, it is not the final notice, it's never the final notice. Okay. Liar. <laughs> yes. But you know, we went a whole year, and I've always filed our own tax returns, and I, so we finished, and it was right around November that we started to tithe, because that was when I finally decided I, need, I, I couldn't keep doing church once every three months, going to these conventions and going to the Sunday service. I needed to get in a church. So we got in a church, and we got going, and, we, and very early on we got that, so we started tithing. It was November. I did the taxes a month or so later, so I know what it was. We went a whole year tithing. You don't notice it when you're in the middle of it. But we went a whole year and neither one of us got sick and had to go to the hospital. We went a whole year and our car never broke down. And that had never happened. Okay? We, old, we went from junker to junker. We always had something that had to get fixed in our car. Okay? The funny part is, is when I did taxes the next year, our income went down. Wow. We had less income. But I had money left over in the bank. Okay? Yes, sometimes that we like to think that him pouring out that blessing is just being more money. No, sometimes it's divine healing. Sometimes it's, yes, you know, sometimes right. it's rebuking the devourer for our sake. Yes. Okay? So I, for, for me, it's never been, since that teaching, it's never even been an issue of whether we were going to tithe or not. So that's why when the Lord kind of said, really, what does that say? I kind of, when the Lord asks me a question, I know I've stepped in it. Okay? I just, okay, I, because usually I come to him and I, I, I'm, I think I'm prepared in myself. I'm coming to him. I'm coming to him with the word. I'm coming to him. Okay. First of all, God already knows. Okay. Understand, m m many times the reason for prayer 
isn't to let God know what you need. Okay? It's to help build the faith in you to understand that it's part of his blessing. He wants it for you. Prepare yourself for it. Okay? It's not like, okay, Lord, I'm coming to you and God goes, oh, I didn't see that, Jay. I'm so sorry. Let me get right on that. I mean, but we, we kind of, I don't know, maybe I'm the only one, but you get wrapped up into that kind of thinking. Like, nobody knows the trouble I'm in seeing. You know? Okay, one, there's nothing new. The devil's not come up with any new tricks. He might come up with different tools as you have social media that wasn't maybe here 40, 50 years ago, but the tricks are just the same. He's just using a different tool. So nothing's new, but we like to think that, oh, we are the only person who's ever faced this in the history of the world. Yeah, yeah. Eh, Bible even tells you that's not the case. But I'm um, sidetracking, so I'll come back off the rabbit trail. But I, th I wanted... When you have that perspective of where we were when we started to tithe, where we were a year later, nothing in the natural, to the people around, it was the same car, only it never broke down. Okay? We were still at the same jobs. We had a comic book store at the time. Okay? Nothing seemed to change on the outside. But all of a sudden, we had a little bit of money left over. And I realized, wow. You, and, and like in the middle of the year, I didn't notice it so much because we still had bills. Now, they weren't changing colors as often, but you don't, you, again, occasionally you'd still get that colored bill and you're kind of like, oh, okay, you know. Yeah, sometimes you kind of get in the middle of that, what you think is a rut, and you aren't, you aren't properly focused on where you should be seeing. But at the end of the year, when I filled the taxes and I went, wow. I mean, it was like, it wasn't just barely, I mean, we had like $5,000 less come in. And if you're already living almost paycheck to almost paycheck, and you have $5,000 less, how are you going to make that work? And I'll tell you, in the natural, you won't. But we aren't part of the natural. We are supernatural people. We have angels that work on our behalf. The word works. So... When you are preparing and thinking about prosperity and coming to that whole, what does it really mean? And to me, what prosperity truly means for us as new covenant, born-again, spirit-filled Christians, it kind of means, and I'm reading it out of the Amplified, so that's why I'm using my phone. But I'm in 2 Corinthians chapter 9. And if you've come here for any length of time, you've heard us teach about this when it comes to receiving the offering. So it won't come, it's not a new scripture. But think about how this all finishes. And I'm going to start in verse 6. And I'm reading out of the Amplified. Remember this. He who sows sparingly and grudgingly will also reap sparingly and grudgingly. And he who sows generously that blessings may come to someone will also reap generously and with blessings. Okay, now I'm going to stop here for a second. Sows, what do you normally sow? Seed. Remember how I talked about the parable of the sower? We like to use it for other areas, but I think you can apply money in that parable just like you can in the scripture, because that's clearly what he's talking about here. He is not talking about if you throw a whole bunch of seed in the cornfield, you're going to get a great crop. If you don't throw it out, you're going to get a terrible crop. That's not what he's talking about here, but there's a, the, one of those parallels. Seed can mean multiple things when you start talking and applying it in the word. So verse 7. Let each one give as he has made up in his own mind and purposed in his heart, not reluctantly or sorrowfully or under compulsion. That will get a lot of you. For God loves, he takes pleasure in, prizes above other things, and is unwilling to abandon or do without a cheerful, joyous, Prompt to do it giver, whose heart is in his giving. Amen. Okay, we're not done yet, but stop and think about if you can focus on what, you, what God wants you to do with your money and spend it appropriately, God's not going to do it without you, and he's going to find ways to make more come to you so you can keep doing more, because look what happens when you go on to verse 8. And God is able to make all grace, 
every favor and earthly blessing. Yes. Earthly blessing, okay? That's okay. Come to you in abundance so that you may always and under all circumstances and whatever the need be self-sufficient, possessing enough to require no aid or support and furnished in abundance for every good work and charitable donation. Amen. Does he need you to be a millionaire to accomplish your calling? No. He might for some of us. Maybe some of us are meant to. Maybe that's what somebody is called to do. But this doesn't talk about, oh, do this and you become a millionaire. But sometimes we like, because we all would like, we all think that, oh, if I only had a million dollars, there'd be so much less pressure in my life. And that's a lie from the pit of hell. More of anything generally requires more responsibility, which creates more, more it needs more integrity, it requires more pressure. And if you have more, the devil's going to, you become a bigger target for the devil. I'm just telling you, because I've told you I've helped a number of people with their finances. And the sad part about that is, while that's true, almost half of them, what happened is they applied it, they saw the fruits of it, they said the increase happened, and what did the, and and in the natural that took the pressure off. So far so good, right? But what did they do when their pressure was off? Ah, and they went right back to the habits they had before. And just like the scripture says, we're after a while, it comes back with seven of his buddies, and it's worse. Yeah. Some of the people ended up worse because they didn't take the time, the grace they were being given while that pressure was off to adjust and make the final changes they needed to get over that hump, to get to where they really needed to be. But when you talk about wanting us to prosper in all things, that's what, I mean... To me, the Amplified does so, such a good job. It's like, you are taken care of, your, your needs are supplied. And I'm going to abundantly bless you for every good work and charitable donation. So if he needs you to bless that family in front of you in the grocery line, you don't even have to go, oh, do I, oh, I wonder how many groceries they got. Do I, can I you know, get my calculator out? Do I have enough? The Lord says, bless them. Okay, done. You know. Tells you to make Christmas dinner for the family next door. You don't even, you know, oh, I wonder what they, yeah, done. Because you're focused more on what he's telling you to do. And not focus on, well, can I afford to do what he's telling We can't afford anything, okay? Nothing you see up here is because of anything Jay's done. Other than the fact that I've been obedient, okay? I mean, there is, I, there's an if there. I mean, I, I've had to do what he's told me to do. But there was no goodness in Jay that the, you know, yeah. Yeah. that was going to accomplish it by himself. Because I can tell you, without the Lord, wealth is dangerous. I mean, a person, an example after example of people who become wealthy, famous, it destroys them. Because they don't have the discipline in their life to recognize the leeches, to recognize the, the thieves that come to steal, kill, and destroy. Right. That's why if you, are, if you get to a place where you think you have more money like that, praise God. First of all, if that happens, we should all be happy. Mm -hmm. Okay. When, we, when you hear that, the story from Ambassador Huggins about those 34 million years, you should rejoice. That's a, it's a reason to rejoice. But there's also a, there's a teaching part to that that we should hopefully be able to apply to our lives no matter where we're at. Right. Whether you're a, a hundred heir or a billionaire, the, the principles of focusing on God and his word and doing what he tells you, okay, he might call upon the billionaire to more charitable works than he calls the hundred heir. But who was it that got noticed at the, at the temple? Wasn't all the rich rulers bringing all their money? It was the little. It was the widow with her two mites. Yeah. Do you think she heard, "Well done, thou good and faithful servant"? Yeah. I mean, I mean, you see where I'm coming at with this. It, um, 
I didn't want to get into the, too much of the, there are some natural things you can do to kind of help shake your thinking about your money. Um, I, I, wasn't gonna, I thought about doing it here and I thought, no, I can't. It's so hard because I can't follow up individually. But when I actually um, tutor a, a family one-on-one, -on -one, the first thing I do is I give them a little, one of those little pocket spiral notebooks and a pen. And I say, for the next two weeks, every penny, every dollar, anything you spend, I don't care what you spend it on, I don't care where you spend it, I don't care how you spend it, you write it down in this book. You would be surprised how that alone, that one exercise, because stop and think about this for a second. If you, every time, stop at the gas, oh, and I got my cup of cappuccino. Okay? There might be nothing wrong with you spending the $4 for your cappuccino. Cappuccino. But if you even hesitate a little bit to write that down in your tablet, that's your spirit telling you, uh-oh, <laughs> maybe that was supposed to go somewhere else. Like I said, if you aren't willing to come up here, yeah. I mean, um, Brother Al used to talk a lot about, you want to show me where your heart is? Bring your checkbook. Yeah. I'll know where your heart's at. I'll know where your heart's at. Just show me your checkbook. Not only do we do what's important to us, we spend money on what's oh, important yeah. to us. That's right. And that doesn't mean that if you actually like to go out and get your ice cream cone, that that is somehow a sin, okay? God wants us to have fun, too. Yeah. But he wants us to be listening all the time. And occasionally, maybe we have to give up that ice cream cone to help somebody else. Um, when Pastor Tom talks about how, well, maybe you want to pray about because maybe you need to do without your pizza dinner this week. So you can give in this. And, and it, I think that's always it's good teaching because if we can take our eyes away from ourselves Amen. and not look at what I'm going through. If you're not feeling 100% health-wise, pray for somebody else to do healing. I'm telling you, it, it does wonders for you. And it's because it's almost like it's a mental stumbling block that, oh, Patty deserves healing. Maybe I don't. We somehow, one of the tricks of the devil is he likes us to compare our weaknesses against other people's strengths and it never, matches, it never measures up. Okay? But then he also tries to take our strengths and compare it against other people's weaknesses to make us think more highly of ourselves than we ought. Okay? To me, humble means I'm thinking about myself the way the Lord is thinking about me. Okay? Which means I know there are areas that he's working on. There are areas where I, I do have some, a, a foundation well built that I'm solid in. That, you know, my whole life's not crumbling apart. Okay? Talk about the, my, one, of my, one of the favorite songs I found during the whole COVID crisis was My Feet Are on the Rock. And I just like that because no matter what happens... I'm fine. I'm taken care of. Hallelujah. No matter what would happen with this election, I voted for where I'm supposed to. The Lord take care of me. Amen. And I know that that works because in 2008, when President Obama was elected, I didn't vote for him because I wasn't supposed to. And that's not a political statement, okay? The Lord told me to vote for who I voted for. But while the whole world literally went to hell, with the housing crisis, the crash, everything. I mean, seriously. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Our income doubled. Wow. I got a promotion at my job. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't do anything necessarily to, okay? Seriously, I was at work, serving the Lord, doing what I was supposed to do. One Monday they came in and said, hey, one of our clients is having an issue with their payroll person and they need someone to help write procedures because they're leaving. Would you be willing to go and spend a couple weeks at our client and write procedures so when they hire their replacement you can help train them. Done. I mean, you know, first of all, I was driving to Appleton to work, not a big deal to me, but to some people it was, you work in Appleton? I'm thinking, I drive to Sturgeon Bay to go to church, driving to Appleton to go to work, that's easy, okay? I found that about the time it took me to get from my car to the house was, was okay, one side of a cassette tape. Okay, so each day I got to hear one whole tape. 
because it was about 45 minutes and 45 minutes. Yeah. I'm dating myself because now they don't even have cassette tapes anymore. But So I actually found it as a time where I, again, I'm in the car, I'm alone, but I'm hearing the word. So they come. Funny part is the client is here in Green Bay. So now all of a sudden, I get an extra hour a day that I can do other things because it only takes me 15 minutes instead of 45 minutes. Two, I get paid mileage to drive to work because I'm driving to a client. Yeah. I'm no, I, so from my home to where I worked and back, I got paid for that. And I did it. I organized it as best I could. And after about four months of this, and I'm still doing this and they haven't hired a replacement yet, Okay, I'm doing their payroll. I've got the procedures written. I'm, you know, I'm still working for the other company. Okay, logging in on their time shot, doing everything I was doing before. The my current employer now comes to me and says, "Would you be willing to just take the position? We really like you. We'd like to keep you there." And I said, "Well, I'm very flattered by the offer, but I love where I work. So you would have to work something out with them. I would not." I would not want to give notice to my current employer unless I know that I can leave on good terms. I like where I work. I like my job. So they worked it out. And, I, and I, like I said, in the course, of, my income doubled. My salary doubled. Well, not quite doubled, but like a 45% increase. That was all God. Then we had to be smart with how we applied it, what we did with it. You know, I've made mistakes. I've screwed up. That's one thing. I don't want you to come up here and think that like, I'm some sort of guru fi with finances. I'm, I'm not. I'm growing in that area. I, I believe I have some of the wisdom of the Lord to help me in that area. But more importantly, if I, uh, and when I pray and I was like, oh, I've got all these things I want to, you know, I want to impart what I wanted to, what it kind of boiled it down to. If I could reduce it down to one core element. It was prospering in all things even as your soul prospers. Prosperity isn't a one-time arrival. Your prosperity should grow as your wisdom in the word grows. Your influence in the world should grow as your knowledge in the word grows. Because I didn't do as an in-depth search as I thought I would, but I searched some for some. You won't find it, at least I couldn't find it, where it says, seek riches. Yeah. Pursue riches. I found plenty of scriptures that say pursue wisdom. Yes. Yep. Knowing what to do. To me, the, okay, there, there are more probably technical definitions that are more accurate, but to me, wisdom is simply knowing what yeah. to do and when to do it. And if you can shift your focus, I'm not saying not don't balance your checkbook, quit worrying about it. But if you, stop, if you spend less time focused on your finances and more time focused on whatever it is the Lord's calling you to do. Some people he might be calling to own their own business. Some people maybe already do, and he wants them to expand. I don't, I, I don't, don't try to think I'm trying to prophesy to anybody here. I'm not. But if we spent more time focusing on what the Lord wants us to do, what are you called to do? Um, oh, I didn't write the scripture down. Now it just came to me. The Lord shall give you the desires of your heart. That's another one of those scriptures that has a dual meaning. First of all, he's going to plant that desire in you. He's going to plant it in you to where you, I mean, when Pastor Tom calls me in a pastor on a, a calling, he couldn't, he wouldn't be happy as a truck driver out on the road. As much as he likes to trick himself sometimes, oh, it would just be so much easier to walk away from it and drive a truck. That calling, that, that, that desire in his heart wouldn't let him do it. He just couldn't be happy there because that desire the Lord planted to him. The other side of that same coin the Lord's not going to give you that desire if he's not going to give you the means to accomplish it. Yeah. He's going to give you that desire yeah. by helping you accomplish it, blessing you, yeah. empowering you, giving you the power to get wealth. Yeah. doesn't give you wealth. doesn't promise wealth. Promised power. Yeah. 
didn't promise you wealth. To me, that's where I'm going to, okay. Again, this is a political statement, not necessarily a, a secretarial spirit a statement. To me, our country was founded on the Declaration of Independence, endowed by our Creator for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. There is no guarantee of happiness in that promise. There is life. So for me, any political decision about any candidate, about any platform, about any party, about any starts and stops with the discussion of life. If you don't believe that every life is precious, you are not scriptural. I don't care how much other scripture you want to talk about. Life is valuable. And anybody who tries to cheapen life is cheapening the, the foundation of this country. Okay, there's my political statement, okay? <laughs> but there's also no guarantee of happiness. I'm tired of people saying, I'm going to force a minimum wage of $15. First of all, where does that money come from? Do you, think the, do you think the owner of the McDonald's simply has a million dollars in his bank account? So, well, I can afford to pay my people $15, sure. He doesn't. Come on. <laughs> you can't force increase without first taking it from somebody. Everybody talks, oh, I want this $2,000 stimulus package. Why? That money comes from somebody. The government just doesn't invent money. They get that money. Well, first of all, they are getting that money now for about 40 years. We have such a huge national debt because they've lost complete track. They tried to use money as power. Our federal government is a perfect example of money is power in the world system. Remember, we're not... Oh, we're in the world, but not of the world. Mm -hmm. But you can't, the government can't bless Jim unless he gets money from, unless the government gets money from everybody else to give to Jim. Yeah. If Jim went to Melissa's house and stole all the money out of her purse, he'd get arrested. <laughs> but if the government comes and taxes Joel and Melissa's business to give to Jim, yeah. well, that's okay. Yeah. Yeah. The end result's the same. Right? Okay, we're talking about money, so yeah, I did. I kind of got off into a little. I, I don't. But we let the world's impression of money influence us in ways that we never. We would never allow someone to tell us in the world. We would never let their thinking about alcohol influence us. We would never go, oh, getting drunk is great. You got to do it all the time. We'd never let that mentality influences because we're better than that. We have the word that tells us not to get drunk, not to do that, not to be you know, drunk in excess. But yet, we let the world's thoughts and perceptions about money influence us all the time. Well, you have to have a house. You don't want to be paying rent. You, you know, you're paying rent to an uh, owner for an apartment. You could be putting that into a house and be good. Not if the Lord doesn't tell you to. I'm not trying to say that the principle's bad, but without applying the Lord, without the Lord in here telling you what to do, either one could be right or wrong. He might have you in an apartment to influence everybody else in that complex. You don't know. The Bible says, to, uh, let, me, uh, let me read it to you so I'm not just paraphrasing it. It's in Romans 13. The only disagreement I ever had with a, the lovely man of God that I went to Africa about was on this scripture. Let me. I'm so used to using my Bible now, I have to. Actually, I have to use my tabs more. <laughs> Romans chapter 13. We need to get much better at taking the word literally. What does it actually say? Not does what not not does what somebody say about what it says say. But what does the word actually say? So, Romans chapter 13. I'll start wrapping it up here. 13, I'm going to start in verse 6. For because of this you also pay taxes. 
for they are God's ministers attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, honor to whom honor. Verse 8. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. Dale, Dale Rotz has meant a lot to me and my wife very early on in our walk. He came to the Blue Building um, because the Blue Building had, was a partner. And they talked about their first trip to Zimbabwe and the miracles that were performed. And he, from the pulpit, said, And my wife and I are believing for a, another couple to come with us on the next trip. And the Lord put my heart. I looked at my wife, and she was looking at me at the same time. And I went, No! Because <laughs> the Lord prompted that we were supposed to go. And I struggled with that for a while, actually a long while. My wife, not so much. My wife went home, wrote her list out, and invited Dale and Pearl over for dinner. <laughs> Funny story. On that list was, are we going to face wild animals? Nope. No wild animals. We'll be in populated cities. Um, well, we have hot water, I think was on their list. Yep. Are we going to be able to take a shower? And they're like, well, not a shower per se, but they let you take a hot bath. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I'm telling you, if you know my wife, she's a list person. She had a list. <laughs> Dale and Pearl had the patience of the saints as they went through every question on that list. But I guarantee you, nowhere on her list was there, well, I have to deal with spiders. I'm telling you, it was not on the list. But we spent 30 hours flying from Chicago to Amsterdam to Kenya to Zimbabwe. You get there. We didn't fly first class. We flew coach. So you are extremely tired because you've had two nine-hour layovers. If you're around me, and it, okay, I'm ripe. I stink. I have sweat through my clothes. We get there. We get to the pastor's house that we're going to be staying for 30 days. Okay? And they've gone out of their way to make sure their house is clean, well presented, ready to go. They had a live-in person from their church that they asked to live someplace else for 30 days so they'd have the extra bedroom for us. I mean, seriously, it was good. And they're really proud of it. And the pastor's wife takes Dee into the bedroom to show the bedroom, opens up the little cupboard, and the walls move. <laughs> There's spiders, and I'm not, the body was like a half dollar was the body. But they were paper thin. You could close the door and they would crawl in the door jam. They were, they were, okay. But on the other hand, if you squish one of them, it's, well, never mind, I won't. But, so here we are. We have just spent two and a half days. She didn't ask about bugs. She did not ask about bugs. Dale and Pearl did not lie to her. They, she did not ask them about bugs. She came out here and she had one of those fake smiles on her face. Say, can I talk to you for a minute? No, nice, calm. But she had grabbed my arm. I had bruises on my arm for a week. She grabbed my arm so hard. Jay, can we talk for a minute? And she pulls me aside. I'm like, what, wait, what, what? Look at that. And it was just, it was a spider, okay? I mean, I'm not as freaked out. You're going to do, I'm like, D, we're here for 30 days. I'm going to stay in the airport. You're going to do something about this now. <laughs> so I'm like, Lord, what am I going to do? I'm here for, you know. So what did we do? We applied the blood. And I dealt, I had one spider come below that bloodline. And I killed it. The whole 30 days we were there. We simply believed that no deadly hint should harm us. Okay, you go into the kitchen and cockroaches are crawling in and out of the oven because, with, even with the oven running, because that's just, you know what? I didn't, I, no deadly thing should harm me. I just, you know, that wasn't my focus. 
No. For next, the first three nights, it's Africa hot, you know, like 80 degrees at night and humidity. We've still got blankets like over our head because she's not going to let anything crawl underneath the covers in the middle of the night. Okay, I'm not picking on D because... It's real, easy. it's real easy to laugh about it here or to think, oh, I could go serve overseas. Guys, it is nothing like what you think it is. It did, it did bring out an appreciation for what we have. Understanding, truly understanding. Um, all seriousness aside, I saw people martyred. I saw people murdered in the vehicle ahead of us. With no other, uh, hey, it was a checkpoint. Zimbabwe isn't much better now, but it was even worse when we went there. The president had, first of all, when they won their independence, he was much like their, our George Washington. He led the army. He was a good leader. He did everything right. They asked him to become president. Boy, it sounds really familiar, right? Well, he was more than willing to take it where George Washington didn't want to be president. And then he named himself president for life. Wow. And the closest way I can compare it is if you study Nazi Germany, they had the SS and the Gestapo. And the SS was kind of the legal arm of the government and the military. If you needed something done that was pretty much on the right side of legal, the SS did it. They took care of it. And the president of Zimbabwe had the military police. The Gestapo is the one that did all the wet work behind the scenes, in the dark, secret that you don't want anybody to know stuff. And the president of Zimbabwe had his war veterans, and that's what they did. If he needed something done that was purely illegal, they did it. We went to a university on a Tuesday night for their Bible study and preached the word so we you know, got to know these young kids. And they were kind of excited because they were going to do they were going to do a peaceful protest about the cost of their meals at the university. It had they had been promised that their price would be X. They got to college and the government raised the price and they were going to have a peaceful protest in the cafeteria. Word of that protest got to the president somehow. And the night before the protest, actually the night we, after we taught and were gone, the war veterans stormed that university, dragged people out and murdered them. People that we had just taught. And you see that and you think, well, that could never happen here. Guys, are you paying attention? Don't, don't take our freedom for granted. Even the freedom we have to be here don't take that for granted. You know, some of, the, we, some of the areas we met in people's homes because we didn't, you know, we were actually threatened. We were told if we had church the next day, they were going to come and kill us. I wanted to go. I'm like, I am not letting the devil kick me out of this one. We we're already like 21 days into this. I'm like, I'm, I'm, I had seen too many miracles. I'd say, not even knowing where we're going to go today, get in the vehicle. Just drive somewhere, show up, knock on somebody's door, pay them 50 bucks to use their electricity, hook up the sound system, boom, here we go. Going to have just a meeting on the street. And I saw people come to the Lord. I saw people healed. I saw, he used me to do that. Funnily enough, on a day that I didn't expect to, I was going because everybody was going, but I wasn't teaching that night. I thought, oh, I got that off. We get there. And Brother Dale comes up to me and he goes, Lord says you've got something. I'm like, what? Really? You didn't tell me. I'm like, no, I got nothing. <laughs> okay. So I'm, I'm like, okay. I mean, of anything, the, the, one of the reasons I think we were blessed so much in the trip is we agreed in agreement that we were going to follow the guidance of Dale and Pearl. They were, they were our spiritual leaders. While we were over there, we were going to do what they told us to do, and we were going to operate under that protection we were doing. Even if what they told us maybe was wrong, as long as we knew that they weren't purposely misleading us, we were going to follow them. So I went, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, okay. I Literally, I was like, Lord, what? And if you were to do that anywhere here in Green Bay, and in the middle of the night look up, 
even if the sky is clear, the stars don't have the same beauty and purity that they do. Where we were at in Africa, there just wasn't the same pollution. Here in Green Bay, even though it's not as bad as it used to be, there's still enough pollution in the air that just kind of mutes it a little bit. But then and then I kind of went, Lord, and I was just awestruck at the beauty of his creation. It was absolutely spellbound. And it, I was just like, and literally, the sh it's the shortest sermon I've ever done. And he's like, I wish it was, today was this short. We'd be done already. But <laughs> I, I literally, I, I grabbed the microphone and I said, everybody, look up. If you want to know the person who created that coming up here, boom, I was done. I started praying for people. That's it. It worked. That same night, I laid hands on people who were deaf and their ears were opened. I, again, it wasn't me. That was the trick. I'm going to get back to Brother Dale. That was the purpose of this. Um, but I kept telling myself that I couldn't do this. I couldn't go. And finally, the devil overplayed his hand and said, well, what do you think you're going to do? Raise somebody from the dead? And I chuckled because I realized, no, I'm not going to do a single thing. He's going to do it through me. And from then on, it was that decision. It's done. The trip happened, miracle things. I can say that had I been more spiritually in tuned, I would have raised somebody from the dead. I felt the opportunity to come in me. I knew I was supposed to happen. But before I could speak and act, the pastor of one of those students that was murdered, when he, we were all kind of there praying, having breakfast when he found out. And the story came on, and the, the other student who came reported it said, what are we going to do? And instantly I knew what we were supposed to do. I knew, I'm, like, I'm ready. And I started to stand up. I got ready to say something, and I was a little hesitant. I'm like, are you sure? I mean, I, I mean, it's my fault, okay? Please understand that I have to take the blame for this when I send on judgment seat. I knew that if I went and laid hands on him, he'd come, we'd raise him from the dead. I, it was the power that came upon me. When Pastor Tom talks about the gifts of miracles, yeah, it's not, it, it is so radically different. You can't. It's hard to put in the word sometimes the difference that how that that anointing feels on you. It's so different than believing to get rid of my headache or believing for enough finances, or whatever. But the pastor said, "We're going to prepare for a funeral." Gone. That anointing. I mean, it didn't slowly dissipate. It was like a light switch. Yeah. And unfortunately, I mean, again, don't make this sound terrible. That person still got to be in heaven, okay? I mean, uh, boy, what a terrible uh, yeah. result that was, huh? I mean, you know, we, we forget that sometimes. Yeah, yeah. But it was a lesson to me, like, oh, the power of words. When you talk power of life and death, I felt that. He was that, that student's spiritual father in that situation. Wow. Okay. But I came back to that whole old man, nothing to love him. Because it's the only disagreement I ever had with Dale. Because Dale put his own twist on it that said, as long as you're paying your bill every week, you don't actually owe anybody. Really? Do you really own that car? Or does this bank own it? I can tell you that the title is usually in the name of the bank. <laughs> Do you really own that house or does the bank own that house? Okay. Now again, I'm not doing this. I'm not trying to. I don't want to. I'm not trying to criticize anybody. I'm not trying to beat people up. But stop and think about it for a second. We, the world says that as long as you pay your bill, you're okay. The Bible says, "Owe no man nothing but to love him." Okay, I didn't. No, owe no man nothing. There's no twisting in that. It is simply what it says. And I think that if you are at that point. If you can get your life to where you owe no man nothing, it is a lot easier to hear him when he tells you to do something with the money you have. That's, I don't necessarily have a, a direct scripture that supports that, but I think if you read through it enough, I will share some more when we start talking about strongholds 
and how it warps your thinking. That's what strongholds kind of do, that you'll see some of that become more clear. But I think you'll find that if you can get to the point in your life where all you have to do is to love on people and to renew your mind, love more people, renew your mind, you'll find that your financial situation clears up. It becomes clear. It becomes easy to understand. It fits into place. Because if you don't have balance, if you are so heavily swayed towards finances, you could be wealthy and sick as a dog. Where's the joy and prosperity in that? Okay. On the other hand, you could be so afraid of money and you could be perfectly healthy walking in divine health, praying in tongues more than y'all, and have so little influence because you don't even want to deal with the challenges that come with properly wheeling money. The easiest thing in the world was for that servant to do nothing with the money when the master gave it to him. Didn't have to do a single thing. I can keep doing my own thing, going to job every day, nine to five, I'm good. But yet, wicked. Kick him out. Get him out of here. It wasn't easy for the one with two to go out there and create two more. It wasn't easy for the guy who was given five to go out and create five. But they did it. So if you can change your perception of prosperity and understand that it'll be a progressive growth in your life, that he will prosper you in all things as your soul prospers, as you gain more wisdom, as you gain more knowledge. He now can trust you more in different areas. If you get nothing out of else out of today than that, then hopefully you'll be blessed enough to make a change and, and influence more people. So with that, I'm going to just stop and, and get ready to receive an offering. I don't think I need to give a lot of scripture on that after what I talked about today but for one second the the best offering message I ever heard believe it or not was from Dr. Mark Barkley he was at Cornerstone Family Church it was more or less a pastor's meeting we got to go with Pastor Tom and Stella and he went up to receive the he was supposed to be preaching that day and somebody else was giving the offering and you could feel the resistance. And Dr. Barkley got upset. Not in an unscriptural way, okay? You understand even Jesus overturned the, th the money changers table and he never, he, everything he did was in love, so don't. But Dr. Barkley got up here and said, how many of you decided last week that the owner of Walmart didn't deserve his money and went in and grabbed your groceries and said, you don't need my money, I'm just going to take this food and go. Oh. How many of you waited until after you ate the meal at the restaurant and said, you know what, this wasn't really any good, I'm not going to pay for it. But you ate the whole thing. There isn't a single area in the world where you can get away with that. But yet, here's an opportunity, not I'm, he, I'm not commanding you to do it. You have an opportunity to sow in to ministries that are in fact, uh, impacting lives. And you are holding back, thinking that you could have better uses for your money. And he went for about 15 minutes and just laid into, you don't go to a movie without paying for a ticket first. You get arrested if you will just walk in and grab whatever groceries you want and don't pay for it. You'd lose your car if you just went and filled it up with gas whenever you wanted to and never paid for it. But yet, here in the church, because it's offerings, we somehow think that it's okay. And as we get ready to pray for this, one last little nugget to think about. The word says that we're going to be judged by every idle word that we speak. Every idle word. 
that ought to humble a bunch of us. Okay. Why do we think that we're not going to be judged for every idle dollar we spend? I don't want to condemn you, but I hope it convicts you to th at least think about what you're doing. And then, as Pastor Tom probably watches this and either decides whether I'm, he wants me to keep going or whether he wants me to do it on YouTube, either way. Like I said, I, I, I want to spend, if I get the opportunity to continue on, we'll spend time talking about um, strongholds. The reason strongholds are so effective is that you don't know that you don't know. You don't recognize the stronghold until somebody literally knocks it down for you sometimes. So I wanted to give you the hope and the understanding of what prosperity can be before I start pounding people up and beating them up and <laughs> <laughs> exposing different strongholds. So hopefully we'll get a chance to share that soon. But has, has everybody had an opportunity to give that didn't have? Okay. Then we'll receive that. There's, there's giving in the tithe and there's tithing it, presenting it to the Lord. So I always like the fact that we do that together as a congregation. So go ahead and stretch forth your hands. Dear Heavenly Father, we aren't doing this, we aren't giving this to you because you need it. You've already provided every spiritual blessing. We give this to you because we love you and it's already yours. The silver and gold is yours. By giving this to you, we put our trust in you that you will continue to provide for us. You'll continue to rebuke the devourer for our sakes. You will continue to keep us blessed. We thank you for that, Lord. I ask that every person here be blessed, that the word that I gave today, that the parts that were from you and your Holy Spirit would sink in and they would produce fruit, that they would help live more victorious lives for you and your son Jesus. And in his name we pray. Amen. So, I begin that. And just when I thought it was going to be done. I am in your lives in ways that you cannot begin to see or understand, but I wish to lead you and guide you into all truth, that you may be blessed and may be a blessing upon this land. And you could search the whole world the whole world and I'll still be right within your heart I'll still be leading you through my Holy Spirit and guiding you I will never leave you nor forsake you so take it all the sea Tosha Yanka Terikota Poparisi Onta Ja Takira Tata so by the washing of the water of the word, renew your mind, grow in me, step out with me, and influence the world for my kingdom. Wow, thank you, Lord. Well, I hope that you guys had as much fun as I did. Yes, thank you. I hope you were blessed. And like I said, I, I believe Pastor Tom is scheduled to be here next week, so that will, so that's at least one break for everybody. <laughs> but hopefully, um, we've talked a little bit. Uh, he'll have me continue on. Like I said, hopefully, as you go on now, when you get a new teaching or a teaching that maybe you thought, oh, I've heard this before. To ask why, okay, faith comes by hearing and hearing. And sometimes it's not, sometimes it's because the nickel finally dropped. Pastor Tom talks about that. But I really think sometimes what it is, is since the last time you heard it, your perspective on so many other things has changed that all of a sudden, oh, look at that. That like fills that great big gaping hole I didn't even know was there. 
And I think that that is why faith comes by hearing and hearing. Yeah. Your faith grows because, it, yeah, your faith is at a certain level, but now you see how it fits even better so your faith can go to a new level. Right. So I hope that you'll see that as he t continues to teach upon leadership. Take the other teachings, even, the, even when he's teaching it maybe a different series on Sunday, or if you watch a teaching when he does it on, the, on his YouTube channel. Oh, look how that links right in with the leadership. Oh, look at that. That just fits perfect. If you'll do that more, I think, I think you'll find yourself living a, at least a more joyful life, yeah. a happier life, because you begin to realize, yeah, there, it's, it's not as difficult as we like to make it to be. We make it hard on ourselves. So with that, I'll let you go. Thank you so much for spending the time with me, and enjoy the rest of your Saturday.